first of all everyone happy doctors day uh, today is national doctors day and i uh, hope you are all staying safe uh, my name is dr spandana raila i did my md pediatrics then i did my one year pediatric palliative care fellowship here at hyderabad uh, there is an mnj cancer hospital which is a government regional cancer center and i have done my fellowship there and after that i joined uh, ngo it, uh, it's part local and part international and i have been working them with them since uh, the past 3 years and uh, my work is mostly uh, cancer palliative care till the past 1 uh, and a half year but then we also do community palliative care and also neelofa children hospital uh, so we have a neonatal palliative care services there so we do all that and uh, i'm i'm really thankful for calling me sir because one thing which strongly believe is uh, creating awareness and that is why i totally agree uh, thank you very much and i look forward for the presentation all the best dr dhiraj thank, thank you thank, thank you very much and at the end of it all we will be I, in fact i am very very curious to know what you are doing and how how did you go about it maybe we'll discuss after the presentation yes sir uh, yeah dhiraj if there's sufficient time we can start okay sir so today my topic is on palliative care and pain management in childhood tumors so uh, normally it's uh, 54 to 85% of pediatric inpatients of cancer patients and 26 to 35% to of pediatric outpatients experience pain during the uh, treatment or childhood uh, during the develop uh, during the tumor present okay 60 to 90% of children experience pain at the end of the life during the end of so what is the palliative care is an approach that improves quality of life of patients and their families facing a problem associated with life threatening illness through the prevention and relief of suffering by means of early identification and impeccable assessment and treatment of pain and other problems like physical psychosocial and spiritual so normally we can see the palliative care normally in pediatrics see the cancer comes into the 5.69% as i'm here so the cancer patients who undergo the palliative care is 5.69% who needs the palliative care compulsory what are the goals of the palliative care is first is relief from suffering treatment of pain and other distressing symptoms psychosocial and spiritual care a support system to help individual live as actively as possible and a support system to sustain and rehabilitate the individual's family so that they can cope up with the all other problems what are the aim of the palliative therapy is a form life and regards dying as a normal process to the child and the parents in it intends neither to hasten nor to postpone death it integrates the psychosocial and spiritual aspects of patient care and it uses a team approach to address the needs of patients and their families is applicable early in the course of if uh, it should be applicable in the course of illness in conjunction with the other therapies that are intended to prolong life like chemotherapy and radiation therapy so the most common uh, holistic suffering the patient child will be having is physical social psychological and spiritual when it comes to the physical the pain nausea vomiting pain because of the tumor pain because of the tumor presentation pain because of increase in tumor size pain because of chemotherapy induced pain like uh, pain neuropathic syndromes pain because of tumor presenting entering into the nerves causing neuropathic pain i'll be in, uh, telling in detail and no, and pain due to chemotherapy pain due to radiation, radiation therapy and pain due to other modalities nausea and vomiting due to due to drug involvement due to chemotherapy due to radiation therapy and due to the tumor involving the organs so constipation so most commonly it is because of post chemotherapy or post opioid analgesic drug ingestion and dyspnea is most uh, so one of the physical complaint bowel obstruction and fungating wounds where the patient child will not will have recurrent infections where they can't get because of the immune deficiency social problems what they can face is financial issues as we know it's a very laborious process they have to spend so much of money education their life will be decreased there and uh, the treatment education and everything that means uh, their school length life will be decreased and when they go grow age according to the job also will be decreased job getting social environment like neighbors will be asking them what is the situation what is this so psychological issues will be more so psychologically they feel that denial anger bargaining depression acceptance 
okay and after that helplessness hopeless lack of self worth and despair so it most commonly occurs because of the chronic pain so that they feel that there will be lack of uh, lack of confidence everything and because of the psychological issues there will be fall family collusion and uh, disparity between them spiritual is because and why me and meaning of the disease what should we do next so it comes here the spiritual thing so i'll be detail in detail about the pain so it's nothing but an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage or described in terms of such damage what are the types of pain commonly we see is based on the neuroanatomy neurophysiology pain pathways are uh, types of pains are somatic visceral and neuropathic so each type results from activation and sensitization of nociceptors and mechanoreceptors in the periphery like mechanical stimuli because of the tumor compression or infiltration into the nerves chemical stimuli because of epinephrine serotonin bradykinin prostaglandin histamine released from the tumor or surrounding tissues somatic pain when nociceptors are activated in cutaneous or deep tissues somatic pain results typically characterized by dull or aching but well localized pain so commonly seen in metastatic bone pain poor surgical incision pain myofascial pain musculoskeletal pain the visceral pain results from activation of nociceptors due to infiltration compression extension or stretching of the thoracic abdominal or viscera <laughs> intraoperatorial meds is common with pancreatic cancer where it causes visceral pain it is a poorly localized pain and describes as deep squeezing and pressure like pain acute pain because of the acute uh, autonomic dysfunction it causes nausea vomiting and diaphoresis and the other thing is neuropathic pain injury to the peripheral or central nervous system consequence due to more common tumor compression infiltration of the peripheral nerves or the spinal cord and uh, or due to the chemical injury to the peripheral nerve or spinal cord caused by surgery radiation therapy or chemotherapy pain from the nerve injury is often severe and is described as burning or dysesthetic with a waves like quality neuropathic pain include both metastatic and radiation induced from brachial and lumbosacral pathopathies or could be chemotherapy induced peripheral neuropathies paraneoplastic peripheral neuropathies post mastectomy post thoracotomy pain phantom limb pain so what are the temporal aspects of pain as you see is acute pain and chronic pain acute pain is uh, uh, acute pain as the child experiences sudden onset of pain and chronic pain if it is persists more than 3 months and opioid analgesic in spite of that it is called the chronic pain episodic or intermittent pain occurs during confined periods of time on a regular or irregular basis what is the baseline pain if uh, average pain intensity experienced by child to for 2 or more hours during a 24 hour period you should know about the breakthrough pain is nothing but in between the baseline and pain sudden onset of pain occurs that is transient increase in pain to greater than moderate intensity that occurs on a baseline pain of moderate intensity or less so the study shows that they provide a range of prevalence of breakthrough pain from 23% to 90% of cancer patients during the when the child is having the baseline pain and there is called the incident pain uh, where the child is having uh, when he does an action like flatulence he is having the abdominal pain so how do we assess the child assessment is assessment model and how to we just measurement of the pain is so its site where exactly is the pain onset so as you know the tumor we will get to know uh, character of the pain radiation of the pain where it goes and associate symptoms like nausea vomiting because of the tumor time and duration exacerbating or relieving factors and severity depending on the initial pain score so the scales what we measure the, from a children is two scales we can commonly we see is flacc scale is nothing but face legs arms cry and consolability depending on the score of 0 to 10 so we can see the uh, and face scoring 0 1 2 no particular expression of smile is seen on face in one scoring occasional grimace frown withdrawn disinterested child frequent constant quivering pain clenched jaw is seen and legs as you see the zero it is normal position relaxed and one is uneasy restlessness tense kicking or legs down is up to the scoring is two arms are lightly lying quietly normal position moves easily squinting shitting back and tense is scoring one arch rigid or jerking 
cry no cry or awake is good moans are is scoring one crying steadily screams are some frequent complaints and consolability is difficult to console in uh, scoring two of this one so another thing is face is pain scale normally seen in more than three uh, good to get it so we can see is this patient so how much pain can hurt so we should uh, we can see the facial expression of the child and we can say uh, the, according to the so severe pain you can see the last one and one more thing is numerical rating scale for more than seven years so zero to ten we can see and uh, another thing is visual analog scale commonly we use in adults the same thing is zero to ten management of pain comes under pharmacological non-pharmacological pain control procedural manual management of cancer pain anesthesia and neurosurgical approaches to pain management so the pain management who analgesic slider so pediatric pain management includes only two steps in pediatric pain management so step one is non opioid for mild pain plus or minus adjuvant if the pain persists or increases we have to go to the step two which is opioid plus or minus non opioid plus with adjuvants so non opioids commonly what we use is for more age more than 3 months is brufen paracetamol and if it is less than 3 months only paracetamol is used what the strong opioids we use for the adjuvant is uh, in this one is morphine commonly we use is morphine or fentanyl oxycodone hydroxymorphone and buprenorphine oxycodone hydromorphone are not commonly used in india so morphine is the most commonly used opioid we use so what are the adjuvants so adjuvants is nothing commonly when even of the opioids the pain is not subsided because of the neuropathic pain we go to the adjuvants so commonly the adjuvants are antidepressants which are the most commonly used anti convulsants anti spasmodics muscle relaxants bisphosphonates for bone pains or corticosteroids and corticosteroids so combining combining an opioid and non opioid is effective but uh, should not combine the same class of drugs so that the effect will be lost so time doses based on drug of like and you should not wait for the pain to recur so that you can give this one drugs so non opioid analgesics commonly we use is as i said acetaminophen and brufen commonly administered orally limited by feeling effect that means the pain subsides and we, we should do more drugs also it doesn't affect much means we should have to go to the opioid analgesics so tolerance and dependence does not occur as occurs in opioid analgesics so commonly acts by its acts as analgesics antipyretic anti inflammatory and anti bleed laxatives so the diclofenac drug what we use is 1 mg per kg up to 8th hourly in children preparations available are 25 mg 50 mg and we have suppositories for children and modified release tablets are 75 mg 100 mg brufen it's 10 mg per kg 6th hourly and preparations available you can have tablets also oral suspensions are also available and nifurvisant grand 600 mg per sachet per neonates naproxen is less than 5 5 years is not recommended and more than 5 years 10 mg per kg in two divided doses the preparations available include 250 mg and 500 mg oral solutions for children is 150 to 125 per ml and suppositories in 500 mg so pyroxicam so less than 15 kg 10 mg is given if it is 16 to 25 kg 10 mg daily is given od and if it is 26 to 25 kg child is 15 mg daily more than 46 kg 20 mg daily so preparations include capsules and suppositories so what are the common opioid drugs for the pain management includes weak opioids are tramadol dependrol codeine codeine is no longer mentioned and strong opioids includes morphine fentanyl and methadone so analgesic effects by binding to discrete opioid receptors in peripheral and cns so they do not have sealing effect the more the drug you give the more effect will be there so, and they will have the more complications like side effects nausea vomiting and the commonly antagonist if the more drug is given is naloxone so drug dosage drugs for morphine commonly we use is for more than 3 months loading dose is 0.1 to 0.2 mg per kg and we should switch to oral as soon as possible so come common side effect from in opioids includes nausea vomiting sedation mental clouding constipation tolerance and physical dependence so the clinician should know how to use a drug patient factors such as age renal function route of delivery route of delivery can be oral subcutaneous intravenous intrathecal opioid availability of drugs and cost of the drugs is important
So morphine is the most common drug used, effective drug. So it is cost effective, easy to monitor. It is given oral, subcutaneous, intravenous, buccal roots. Subcutaneous for IV, it is given as 0.1 mg per kg per dose. Oral is 0.2 to 0.3 mg per kg per dose. It is given in 4th hourly. And we have uh, morphine sustained release tablets, which is given 8 to 2 hourly. 8 to 2 hour hourly. So methadone is the second line of cancer drug patients. It has a negative connotation for the cancer patient that it has uh, you should treat addicts. But uh, because of the bioavailability of methadone is higher than that of morphine, it is used. But it needs a proper dosage and also uh, it needs high high clinical knowledge regarding that to give when, when to give the dose. So adverse effects commonly seen with this methadone is drug induced long QT syndrome. So another weak opioid is sorry, weak opioid is. Tramadol. So more than 12 years, we give 50 mg 6 hourly. More than 60 kg, 100 mg 6 hourly. Preparations available on in capsules, 50 mg. And slow release tablets available is 100 mg, 150 and 200 mg. Effectiveness limited by high incidence of nausea, as we have seen commonly in our patients. So fentanyl, normally it's not a topical energy, it's absorbed into the systemic circulation when we give apply. So never apply directly. And you should cover with the tegodum dressing so that it absorbs first. Before giving the fentanyl, choose that its child is stabilized with morphine so that fentanyl act takes time to act. So that's why we change the patch every single hour so it takes time to act. So 25 grams per patch, when we have the different types of patch 25, 50, 75, 100. So we have uh, so 25 micrograms, 72 hours, depending on the session release patches. So Normally, the opiates will give and what we give is oral route is slower and sort of action, delayed peak time and longer duration of effect, commonly seen with morphine and methadone. So sublingual we can give is fentanyl and methadone. Rectal route we can give morphine also. Side effects of opiate analgesics includes sedation and drowsiness. So commonly we deal with it amphetamine, methylphenidate, and caffeine. So the sedation and drowsiness is decreased. Respiratory depression is most common with long acting and short acting opioid. So, uh, we use short acting opioid antagonist Lanaxone. So, we, if using Lanaxone also, we should be very careful because when child, uh, child is fever, respiratory depression, we should intubate so that when given Lanaxone, child will have excess elevation and bronchial spasm during the, uh, during the drug. So, nausea and vomiting. So, haloprodol is a drug of choice for opioid and associated nausea and vomiting. And metoclopramine is another anti emetic drug we use. So constipation, stool softeners we use methyl naltrexone and opiate rotation so that the child should not have the chronic constipation. So multifocal client myoclonus is seen with use of the mepiridine and you should stop mepiridine immediately and start morphine so that the pain is controlled. So what are the adjuvant analgesics for neuropathic pain? So the normal neuropathic pain, the patient doesn't subside with opiate non opiate analgesics. Then we go for the adjuvant analgesics commonly. So the so normally adjuvant analgesics commonly use is antidepressants. These are the first line drugs we use. So commonly use antidepressants are amitriptyline, doxepin, imipramine, clomipramine, and uh, second amine drugs common desipramine, nortriptyline, and sustained uh, serotonin reuptake inhibitors includes paroxetine and duloxetine. So another adjuvant drugs is anticonvulsants. Gabapentin is the most commonly used. Carbamazepine is next. Phenytoin and pregabalin is used for the non-cancer patients most commonly, but we use for cancer patients also. And valproic acid, clonazepam, uh, lamotrigine, topiramine, oxocorbazine are used less commonly and less potent. So other adjuvants using local anesthetic. So intravenous local anesthetic reduces the pain in the peripheral block and uh, we can use uh, local anesthetic can be used as epidural local anesthetics with uh, plus or minus using opioid and uh, opioid and analgesics. And normally, when we use this, when the refractory continuous anesthesia that has not responded to antidepressant anticonvulsants, local anesthetics are commonly used. So other drug adjuvant drug is corticosteroids. It's commonly used in refractory bone pain and refractory neuropathic pain and pain associated with capsular expansion or duct obstruction. Headache because of increased intracranial pressure where it reduces the edema, cerebral edema. So it, it is used as a part of irradiation therapy protocol in epidural cord compression and tumor infiltration of brachial and lumosacral plexus. So other drugs commonly used uh, for analgesia pain management is 
Benzodiapines commonly is clonazepam, neuroleptics is emojite trigeminal neuralgia, and alpha 2 adrenergic agonist drugs is clonidine. And NMDA antagonists commonly we use is ketamine, dextromethorphan. Adjuvant drugs for bone pain is bisphosphonate compounds, gallium nitrate, calcitonin, and radio pharmaceutical compounds like strontium 89 and samarium 250. So, other modalities commonly we use uh, this psychological approaches. So, in psychological approaches, we see cognitive behavioral therapy, hypnosis therapy, and we give some uh, uh, making, uh, make, we give some activities so that the pain will be uh, uh, mentally reduced. So, second one is nerve blocks, other modalities. With nerve blocks, commonly we use this uh, anesthesia induced nerve blocks, neurosurgical nerve blocks. So, nerve blocks includes peripheral nerve blocks, steroid. Uh, peripheral nerve blocks and uh, autonomic nerve blocks. So peripheral nerve blocks, normal we use parapetal blocks, intrapleural blocks, and uh, so stellate ganglion block is commonly used for head and neck pain, and uh, celiac plexus block is for upper abdominal pain because of the hepatic meds or uh, pancreatic cancers. Local anesthetics, IV lidocaine is commonly used. It is given in subcutaneous uh, IV anesthetic and intrapleural. Intrapleural is continuous infusions can be given so that uh, the pain uh, the patient with hepatic meds can be reduced because of the pleuritic chest pain can be reduced. So, what are the neuroablative and neurostimulative procedures? So, neuroablative procedures include rhizotomy, cordotomy, because cutting of the nerves so that the firing, the firing of the uh, dissociated nerves cannot can be achieved. Neurostimulative procedures include Nerve stimulator procedures. Okay. Trigger point injection acupunctures includes injection of the, where the commonly we see the muscle pain and myophysical pain. So the trigger point injection is include uh, uh, insertion of needle to the point where the uh, pain is available, pain is there, and giving the trigger point so that the local injection, local pain is subsided with what we use uh, saline or with. Uh, Commonly, we use this line so that the trigger point is reduced. The physiatric approach includes commonly what we use is <coughs> uh, cryotherapy, and we use this uh, physiotherapy commonly so that the pain is reduced depending on the uh, depending on the location of the tumor. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, yeah, uh, Diraj. It has been quite comprehensive, and to be very honest, most of them went absolutely above my head. Okay, so all I'm asking is, uh, I'm, I'm sure most of the other surgeons also may be feeling. So what I would like to you to do is first to summarize what is practical aspects of that, and then I would like to Spandana and Anu to sort of chip in and tell us the practical aspects, and then Pooja to talk us about uh, what their experience. Can you just put it in a very simple summary of what you have said so far? Iraj? Uh, so commonly the uh, child presents with somatic pain where the because of such poor surgical pain uh, I mentioned the pain path pain sir because of the, normally the pain occurs because of the dissociation between the nociceptor receptors and mechanical receptors because of the continuous firing the child will be having the pain so you should count, uh, cut the pain so that the pain will be removed from the pain so in palliative care main management comes pain management rest the come rest comes the others like nausea vomiting constipation these are things and psycho psychosocial, it's mostly the uh, multidisciplinary team where all the departments are involved to treat the patient, like surgical oncologist, medical oncologist, physiotherapist, and, and the palliative care physician, so that all are involved, so that the, uh, they can give counseling to the child and the parents regarding the disease progression. And the spiritual commonly is uh, we go to the church and uh, temple so that they give the counseling regarding that nothing will happen and it is a common thing. So spiritual thing is what uh, we send, uh, we give to the child and the parents. And social thing is, we would explain them that it is a common thing and uh, job opportunities, whatever it is, what I explained substantially, like uh, uh, child growth, he may die or not, and if the, it's treatable, so it will, uh, morbidity is increased with that. So we can explain regarding the social issues also. And in the coming to the pain management, the common is somatic visceral and neuropathic pain. We normally non opioid analgesics are commonly used, and 60, uh, up to 70% of the patient child can be reduced with non opioid analgesics pain. In spite of the non opioid analgesics or pain is not reduced, we add opioid analgesics along with non opioid analgesics. So, because of that, so pain will be reduced, but 
so another 20 percent where commonly pain is not reduced because of the neuropathic pain so 20 percent of the pain, child, children are patients because of the neuropathic pain pain is not reduced then we go for the adjuvant drugs so adjuvant drugs so commonly we use is antidepressants and uh, anticonvulsants and local anesthetics we give steroids so other drugs what other modalities what we can do is in spite of that pain is not reducing uh, because of like pancreatic cancer pain uh, pleuritic chest pain where it is continuous we can go for uh, local procedures like giving intrapleural procedures subcutaneous uh, uh, intraabdominal procedures like celiac plexus block uh, celiac plexus block if it is neck head and neck pain continuous pain we can go for stellate ganglion block and uh, so that uh, paraventricular block for lower lower limb and the sacrum area where the tumor is involved so these are the procedures commonly what we do in day to day life so that the pain can be reduced and the patient life patient can die peacefully okay dheeraj thank you very much in fact your summary is also quite comprehensive and uh, uh, spandana unfortunately we will not be able to i mean we don't really have too much of a hands on experience i would be happy if you can summarize about what you are doing at uh, hyderabad and then we can continue the discussion yeah yes so uh, even before i joined my fellowship uh, there there is there is a team mostly adult uh, anesthetists who were taking care of children over there so after i joined from my fellowship i was a pediatrician and uh, our team also had a nurse and a social worker uh, the nurse along with doing whatever the nurses are doing in other departments she also sometimes talks to the mother explains more about what is happening to the child how to take care of the child and we have a social worker specifically to address uh, the issues are uh, pointed out by dr deeraj so we talk about emotional spiritual and social support so when we say spiritual it is not just religion like going to temple or church it is also questions like why is this happening to me why is this happening to my child what mistake did my child do to die so soon or to even have cancer at this age so all these are spiritual questions that the family is facing so uh all these things uh, it's not even that we are going to say everything is going to be fine you're going to be fine god does this so it's mostly listening from our part and uh, it is surprising right to think that you need a person just to listen to someone's problems but we do employ them and we make them uh, listen and uh, i do have like three four minutes i just made notes few things i wanted to tell uh, which are very practical i think uh can i go ahead and share those points please 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 waiting for it yeah uh, so a lot of times i think uh, we say as pediatricians pediatric surgeons that uh, pain is going to be there this condition is going to have pain uh, but one thing we do have to remember is uh, even if they survive long term unless we treat the pain now they are at risk for chronic pain conditions in the future so we may save the life but we may be decreasing the quality of life if we are not addressing the pain that is there right now and uh, we all know that relief from pain is a human right and because we are medical professionals we all are supposed to be involved in decreasing that pain somehow so that is one thing so pain has to be assessed and it has to be treated and i think that is one thing as pediatric doctors uh, who are seeing children we all have to address and to assess that we have to be well versed with the scales we don't have to memorize those we can carry them in our pocket we can google them whenever we want but one thing i want to say is uh, as pointed out it is not that we are going to look at the faces uh, on the picture and look at the child and say that the child is in this much pain pain is a subjective sign right so uh, bp temperature pulse respiratory rate you measure i measure it's going to be the same but pain it is not it is going to be what the patient says so we are going to show them the face scale and we are going to tell them ask them how much pain do you have and they select the face so this is something i have seen in the nabh thing the case sheets uh, the faces are there and most of the time the doctors look at the case sheet and look at the patient and they tick them it's not how it is it has to be done the child has to select how much pain they have if less than 2 years they cannot and if they are non verbal and they have other conditions like if they are neurologically affected then we use flag scale and even the numerical scale we are we uh, tell them if zero is no pain at all 
and if 10 is the worst pain you can imagine how much is your pain it feels very artificial when i'm saying here but when you try it with two or three children you see that but uh, yeah some of them have so they have this feeling that uh, you they're decreasing their pain by choosing a number if they say 7 and if the maximum is 10 so they keep saying no 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 sometimes the faces help but again remember when you show the faces don't ask them how do you feel because some of them are like sad and crying so it is not how they feel but how much their pain is so it is not their emotions so if you say pain or like show them and say how you are feeling they might show the crying one because they are in the hospital and they don't like to be in the hospital so that was one thing i wanted to tell you people and one more thing i thought was important regarding the medication part of it morphine is the drug of choice for severe pain so seven and more uh, when it is there especially cancer children we use it very very freely so as you asked in hyderabad how are we involved we have a very good uh, working relationship with the oncologist so even on the day of admission in the hospital if the child is in pain and if we don't yet know the diagnosis i am still going to give them paracetamol i'm still going to give them morphine i'm going to decrease that pain and in the meanwhile they get their biopsy the reports come and they get treatment and their pain comes down and i'm going to stop my treatment so morphine is the drug of choice it, it is recommended by who and a uh, few things regarding tramadol which i have seen uh, so all this information i got after doing my palliative care training right so before get, doing my palliative care training i would uh, use tramadol in children but it is not recommended in children less than 12 years so tramadol can cause respiratory depression and it is not recommended and tramadol is more emetogenic so it causes more vomiting nausea so it is not recommended codeine is not recommended at all in children or even in adults because codeine metabolism is that codeine gets metabolized in our bodies into morphine and then it works so if the enzyme that converts codeine into morphine is more in my body then there is going to be more morphine in my body and i'm going to be respiratory depressed or if it is less i'm not going to get good pain so codeine is a big no and coming to few points about morphine i was thinking uh, so morphine does cause addiction but not in patients with pain pain is a physiological antagonist to mor- uh, to morphine addiction right so if your child is in pain if you give them morphine they are not going to be addicted for that and then one common thing i see even though we are working for years in this hospital the nurses tell that oh this child is addicted they keep asking for morphine okay right? so children have a much much lesser potential for addiction than adults so it's probably that we tell the child in rounds that if you have pain please ask for this injection or take this tablet and it's that they have more pain than they are addicted right so that is something we do have to look at when we are giving more so morphine is the first drug of choice and then if you want to convert them into fentanyl um after stabilizing the dose on morphine that is suppose you are giving them 5 mg 4 daily morphine it approximately is equal to 12.5 mcg per hour of fentanyl so 12 uh, 5 mg 4 daily that is around 30 mg per day of morphine is approximately equivalent to 12.5 mcg of uh, fentanyl if they are on 60 it is approximately 25 so fentanyl is not a topical opioid it doesn't work just locally it gets absorbed into the skin and once you stick it it starts working after 12 hours and it works up to 72 hours but when you remove the patch the action is still there for 12 more hours so that is why when we remove the patch we stick a different patch and it kind of gives a good coverage between the change in time and one more thing if the patient has lot of hair and you're sticking it at that point it doesn't get absorbed well we do not cut the patches the drug leaks out and it doesn't help and uh, if they have fever if they're sweating uh, it doesn't help so uh, fever probably makes it get absorbed more and that is why they might get sedated so you have to be watchful for that and one more point doctor has pointed out is sedation and drowsiness and that we can use some drugs 
I haven't used, oh, that's the slide that's projected right now. So I haven't used those drugs in my four years in pediatric palliative care. I, I, I am sure uh, there are places who use them, but I haven't used. But two reasons why children can sleep after you start morphine. One is the dose is higher. So that is why uh, the doses that I mentioned in the presentation are really helpful. And the other reason is that they haven't slept in weeks. So I have seen so many children, osteosarcoma, especially bone tumors, they haven't slept in weeks. So when I meet them, the first thing they tell us, I have not slept in four weeks, uh, five months. I mean, there are people who haven't slept. So the moment you decrease their pain, they go into this huge long sleep for 24 hours, everyone panics, but it is just their normal sleep, they are arousable. So that could be the other reason. And uh, amitriptylin is the drug of choice for neuropathic pain. Gabapentin is now facing a lot of flack, uh, especially in the US. They're saying Gabapentin data is cooked up and all that. So amitriptylin is drug of choice. You can use Valproate. And benzodiazepines for pain was mentioned very interesting. So I haven't used it as much in pediatrics, but in adult, I see adult too when the doctors are uh, in shortage. So whenever they have these spasms in head and neck cancers, we use uh, 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 mostly lorazepam and clonazepam and it helps them with that. Uh, one interesting drug we did use, but not very often is ketamine. Ketamine helps with neuropathic pain. It uh, acts on NMDA receptors. And uh, I know I'm speaking for a really long time, but few things I wanted to share with you. And one thing I wanted to tell is, there might be a child who is on paracetamol, on fentanyl patch with SOS morphine doses with steroid. And it is totally fine as long as we are, are looking at the prescription. And definitely, if you are using an opioid, definitely add a uh, uh, laxative, uh, preferably Dalcolax, Cremafin. If the child is not, not liking the taste of Cremafin, I use Lactulose because it is a bit sweeter. Buprenorphine, which is so widely used, is not preferred by palliative care people again because it's a partial agonist antagonist. So the pain relief is not very, very good with buprenorphine. And uh, I just want to say at the end that uh, Dr. has shared so many ways we can do non-pharmacological management also. But one important thing, most important thing with children is play therapy. So if they get to play and express, so when he said about uh, total suffering, holistic suffering, total pain, just being away from their sibling, from their house itself is going to aggravate their pain. So I like this example that normal day I get headache. I'm totally okay. I can uh, have a good day. I can manage that pain. But post duty, and I'm very, very irritated if I get the same headache and anyone talks to me, I become a monster, right? Like I feel the pain is so much more because patients have irritated me, the nurses have irritated me. It's the total pain I'm having at that moment. So the same child, normally they have little pain, but when everyone is coming and poking them, taking blood samples, operating them, no one to play, no sibling, they experience much more pain and their mother is crying on the side, right? All the time she's depressed. So they experience so much more pain. So there is so much more we can do for these children. And uh, it, I, I feel a lot of times we are all behind saving lives. We talk about how important that they have to go through that. But if we are not empowering them to lead a normal life after we are done with saving lives, I don't know how much successful we are at that point, right? So, sorry, I, it's, it was almost like a presentation, but these were the few things I wanted to share. No, Spandana, what you said was very insightful because uh, as you rightly said, many of us are not even aware that so much things happen. So more than remembering everything that you said, at least we should, uh, we are very, very glad that we came to know that so much is being done somewhere else and uh, we identify the areas where we are lacking. We should be moving towards it. Uh, one small question before we proceed is about what is the concept of patient-controlled analgesia in children? So patient-controlled analgesia is something uh, West and the corporate sector is doing much more. So, but, uh, but the thing is, it's like that Gillick's competence that the UK talks about where the child is able to choose what they want. So we have to be sure that the child can tell us how much pain they have if they need medication. 
and we give them uh, uh, there's a pump and they have the button and they can keep pressing it and uh, we can limit the number of doses they can get but yes it is being done even in india and yes it can be done for children if you think they are competent enough to decide uh, how much analgesia they want so it is practical have, yes. I, I, are you practicing that uh, spandana uh, so the pumps are a big uh, thing for us uh, so we work with an ngo and we have limited resources so most of our money goes in the human resources and procuring the medication okay i know you uh, uh, welcome to dr anuradha first time she is participating she is our anesthetist and uh, she had uh, been in canada for about a year for a fellowship on pediatric pain management uh, i know your experience uh, and uh, no you are not audible you need to unmute yourself is this better i am trying yeah, to do now that now we are audible now we are audible please okay sir thank you so much for this time inviting me for this presentation and i must say dheeraj did a great job i mean it's a it's a vast topic like you mentioned and uh, you also made one more valid point sir so like in a government setup like us we have not really paid much attention to palliative care even though we do a lot of surgeries and um, uh, I, the way i look at it it's probably because we are not aware of it and also the government and so many things we are not supported well enough to uh, do this palliative care uh, uh, setup sir and uh, uh so this last one year has been a true eye opener for me i mean it's uh, it's been an amazing experience so uh, i just wanted to tell share a few points uh, with all of you so one thing sir with, they have stopped using the term palliative care because it has this negative connotation they think it's mostly end of life so the, they have shifted to using instead of palliative they're uh, using this term called uh, pediatric advanced care team or a pac team so it's not just about end of life when the child is diagnosed with cancer so they are going ahead to do it like right from the starting of diagnosis to help the child to recovery or it could be again end of life care as well so um once we put this use system called palliative it's it's got the stigma like you know it's end of life care let's not get to that point so that is again i think that was a major shift that uh, that was seen uh, i saw in the west sir. so they 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 also realize that when they use palliative not many parents want to open up to them talk to them about their uh, about the impending recovery or uh, death of the child so that's one thing i think if we are planning to set up something like that maybe we should think of a advanced care team and not uh, talk about palliative I, even though that's basically the same job that we are doing and uh, uh, the, uh, the other thing that i thought was uh, like a few things like as physicians we have certain obligations yeah there is this uh, uh, definitely no harm to the patient whatever actions we do we make sure that they benefit the most uh, one of the i mean this is something new that i learned is something called non abandonment sir so what we mean is once you develop a relationship with the patient it has to be carried right from the sickness health up to the end like either either it it culminates in recovery of the child or it probably results in death but you are there throughout with the child and the parent and the team who is also treating so i i thought that was an amazing we have never focused on yes. non abandonment lovely, uh, lovely. so that, that was amazing that was a good thing i thought and uh, uh, sir and uh, like spandana madam she just mentioned about it's a multi, she it's a interdisciplinary multidisciplinary team so in sick kids what i saw was so they the team i mean the core team is basically consists of a physician who is a pediatrician which is again a board certified sub specialist that in palliative care and they also have a psychiatrist a nurse practitioner social worker a chaplain a psychologist a play therapist they also have bereavement uh, therapist so they would encourage us to attend funerals if if there is any i mean if there is a child who is dying in the coaching they would encourage us to attend funerals as well sir and uh, in addition uh, like massage therapist art music therapeutic clowning uh, dogs in the hospital it was it was amazing sir the way they care for the children um, it's great that the government is able to support all these initiatives but i think as i mean um, just because we are in india in a developing country that should not limit our potential as what i think sir as much as possible if if we are passionate and would want to do i think we should think of uh, ways of doing it uh, and i'm sure we'll find the support as well and uh, uh some other things that i wanted to tell was with facts sir so no, what going further before going yes, further 
Mm-hmm. I don't look at this as a pessimistic putting down of our system. Mm-hmm. Because our priorities here have been constantly changing. In fact, mm-hmm. I have been seeing and I am sure Ramchandra sir also will agree. Mm-hmm. For the last 30 years that we have seen, mm-hmm. question of survival to question of improved survival to improved quality of life we have come. Mm-hmm. So it is just a logical next step. Yes, For sir. example, all the talks that we are talking today, mm-hmm. all the decisions would have been futile a few years back. Yes. So definitely we have come a long way and we will go. It's a question yes. of resources, it's a question of changing our focus as and when we are covering more and more survivors. So yes, I'm sir. sure we will find a way out. Yes, the sir. Main, main purpose of involving people from across the country mm. is two things, twofold. One, to see what are things are actually being done in our country. One. Mm. Number mm. two, to get inspired from them and collaborate with them and see how best we can to replicate. At least start initiating. So that yes, in some sir. years down the line, I'm sure it is going to happen. Yes, okay. sir. Yeah, I, ahead, that's very true, sir. I think we should be the best advocates for our patients. And if we don't do the job, I don't see the system moving, the wheels moving, sir. So I, that's something that I learned from there, that we need to get, we need to involve the right people, get things moving. And uh, no matter, even if it sounds impossible, like you told, we have made tremendous progress and I'm sure we'll be able to do that further. And uh, uh, like Padana ma'am told, sir, when they refer about suffering, they're also talking about physical, psychosocial, spiritual, family support, bereavement. And uh, there is also support to the treating team. So it could be intensivist, it could be the cardiologist who is treating the child, or it could be the oncologist. So they have support teams for them as well, sir. So uh, it was it was a great, I mean, I, I was just simply amazed to see all this. And, and uh, so yeah. I, I also want, what, yeah, wanted I, to mention I, that. I, I, just to add to that, in fact, when I was uh, visiting this place in... Uh, uh, Alabama University of Birmingham, mm. there in fact they used to have something called a children's harbor where mm. the uh, children of the siblings of the children because they don't have much care. So the siblings yes. of the children also used to stay there, have their therapy, education and other things. And we used to have this clinical cloning. In fact, I saw quite a few yes. of them coming to Wadi Hospital when I was mm. doing my MCH. So yes. I think we there's a lot, lot more scope to go ahead. Yes, uh, go ahead. Sir. Yes, sir. sir, and uh, um, I, towards the end of life, it's not just pain which we need to focus because we also need to think about most children also complain of fatigue, nausea, vomiting, dyspnea, constipation, which are not because uh, these are unrelated. I mean, uh, these are not the side effects of pain medications, but it could be because of the disease process itself. So, in addition to pain, these are the other things that we would probably need to focus in uh, focus on as what I'm saying. And uh, with regard to medications, I just wanted to say we need to follow the. The WHO guidelines which says, yeah, morphine is the best available in our country. Uh, I I'll also just wanted to tell one more thing. When we're talking about opioids, like in the West, in, uh, like the India and most Asian countries, they produce like 80% of uh, morphine, which is used by the West. So it's only 20% of morphine that we produce, which we are using for our patients, which is not fair. I think, uh, uh, yeah, there is a lot to be done there, I'm sure. Our uh, roots need to be tweaked. We need to make sure that if we have easy access to morphine and other uh, medications. Like, uh, like in the West, nobody would even think of uh, uh, using. Hy- I mean, morphine would be like step one. They, in addition to that, they have hydromorphone, they have oxycodone, they have cannabis, which has been legalized again to use for pain. And we we are still stuck with morphine, which sometimes I mean, yeah, it's okay. Something is better than nothing, I guess. So we just keep. We'll do our best. And yeah, so coming back to the WHO guidelines, it says that give medications by the clock, no with the child, by the appropriate route and by the analgesic ladder. Just that last bit I wanted to add. And um, uh, yes, uh, the other uh, amazing thing that I saw was in addition to the pharmacological methods, they also use this uh, non-pharmacological or integrative uh, therapy. So it involved like physical methods. Depending on the age of the child, it could just be simple hugs or cuddles. Massage therapist would come and make sure that the child is massaged. Or it could be comfort positioning, use of heat and cold, use of uh, tense, and a uh, lot of psychological therapies as well. So this was mostly like guided imagery for children who are more than uh, uh, five years old, hypnosis, and then distraction, biofeedback, abdominal breathing. There is so much available, sir. Wow. Yes. Wow. <laughs> Wow. Um, yeah. uh, you've been at Kidwai for three years and now you, you've taken uh, on oncology as a full-time job now. So, I mean, what is your experience in Kidwai and uh, what do you think will be the directions? And what are the practical aspects of the entire discussion today? 
yes sir um, so actually uh, the thing that i wanted to talk about was like uh, i just one second sir i just one need one yes yeah, sir so basically what we've been using at kidwai is uh, paracetamol tramadol and morphine we have not uh, moved ahead of that of course uh, you know it is a huge fee and uh, they cater to all kinds of patients and pediatric palliative care is not a priority over there but uh, after anuradha coming back you know it's something that i discussed with you that day also i have seen a lot of children in pain i have seen a lot of children in uh, in pain and sometimes you know to see those uh, those kids like that it really 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 breaks your heart because you have been with these children since the day the treatment begins and you have seen them get better and when they get worse it is not you know easy to handle not just for the family but even for you as a treating doctor because you know they look up to you for managing that pain and to get some relief which you are not able to provide so i think that uh, we should collaborate with kidwai and you know all those because they are not able to handle you know beyond morphine so i think we need to do that part for them and uh, if you permit sir we should have a meeting with them and sort of sort of take it a step ahead to neurologic blocks or other therapies yeah. that anuradha was talking about yeah. that is number one uh the second part of it is the practical aspects sir like i said uh, we never really pay attention to what kind of pain the child is coming if the child is coming the first step we use is paracetamol the second step that we use is morphine and then after that maybe some cases we use adjuvants so i think we need to have a particular protocol for our oncologic as well as non oncologic patients which i think anuradha can help me develop as to what we are going to do with these children if this doesn't work what is you know part 2 what is part 3 what is part 4 yeah. so these are the two three things that that i feel and we definitely need to develop a pain clinic anuradha because yeah. you know that that is you know something really That's close true. to my heart i really yeah. cannot see these children in 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 pain like this you know it's, it's Absolutely. sort of criminal sometimes sometimes we send them home sir send yeah. them home with that kind of pain because it is uh, you know the family cannot sustain over here and they just you know kind of go back uh, with that with that pain so this is this is it sir we are not doing much in, in terms of uh, in terms of palliative care so again pooja thank yeah. you very much for broaching the topic in fact i have uh, messaged you this morning to talk to me in fact about yes. uh, apart from the tumor boards two other things one we have to move firmly towards this uh, pay, establishment of pain clinic and also yes, the support that we were discussing when sandeep agarwala was there all right yes, i'll talk yes, about sir. it and we'll take it further as i told yes, i'm not looking at it as a pessimistic it's just a reality check and to mm, see void ahead i am glad that you, at least we are sensitive about it okay yeah, so definitely not look at it negatively yeah. i in fact look at the whole thing very positively absolutely yes, not sir yeah. yes. absolutely not like uh, uh, like i said Anur- anuradha coming back is is uh, is a big thing and you know we have to take this forward and this is going to be our strength this is what yeah, we are going yeah, to do sure. yeah mm. yes so the fact that we are recognizing itself is a big thing sir i yes. i, I Yeah, we should be proud of that, and I'm sure we'll go ahead and do fantastic things. Yes, uh, Dr. Jyoti, good to have you back. We were missing your and your uh, precise comments and your insights. Um, I hope your nephew is well. She had a young <laughs> nephew who was troubling her a little, but I think uh, he is stable now. So welcome back, Jyoti. And Thank please, you, sir. if you have anything to add, we'll be happy. so if uh, like uh, now that dr pooja is in indira gandhi uh, i guess there is a lot of scope for research in the field of uh, pediatric palliative care and that is where i think uh, we ne- uh, our focus needs to move because all the data that we read or all the guidelines are predominantly uh, ad- uh, adaptations from the uh, western world's practice yeah, uh, yes. with the kind of load that uh, you have in indira gandhi probably mm-hmm. the next way ahead is research in palliative pe- uh, pediatric palliative care uh, there is a, a dearth of papers from the indian setup in terms of you know exactly. pain and palliation and uh, that uh, that is the next thing probably that is uh, that should be done at indira gandhi thank you very much jyoti really uh, really an inspiring thing um, ramchandra sir you been hearing this uh, what has been your experience in the way uh, any suggestions from your section uh no thank no, no ramesh uh, um i don't have much uh, uh no, no much thing to to add it's just that uh, you know i'm happy that uh, so many people are available now in our country and uh, it's a great thing so we should make use of the uh, professionals available and uh, 
as uh, dr jyoti has suggested we should probably make uh, our own protocols and our own uh, guidelines for uh, these uh, uh, you know conditions these situations mm -hmm. okay there is also a message from uh, spandana that uh, they offer phone call follow up until the child's death and beyond for bereavement um, mm -hmm. uh, spandana is there if you can elaborate a little more on this so uh, just when uh, dr anradha was pointing out the services i was thinking about uh, why i did not point out that we have home care services so we have five vans that go to different parts of the city and uh, it's mostly an adult program but then we also see children and uh, whoever is registered in that so these are not like ambulance services emergency services these are pre planned visits so the prior day we say that tomorrow at this time we are going to come to your house and we used to go uh, but with the covid thing it has been very very difficult to continue it so one thing we do is the offer phone call support and prior to covid we haven't done so many video calls but now we do video calls we assist the child by video we connect with the local rmp sometimes with the local doctor we provide medication and uh, uh it's very uh, it's really good that you are all planning a pain clinic uh, giving enough medications that last till their next visit is one thing that is very important and then sometimes we have to give so many medications they will they forget what they have to give so they take everything except morphine once they go home because they don't know why it is used so these phone call follow ups kind of keeps them on track because the mother has to handle this child and the other child and other thing. So that is one thing very important hospice is one more thing i don't know how many i i think there are few hospices in bangalore or there is karna shraya hospice so these are the free standing uh, semi hospital kind of things where there is medical care but there is also a lot of uh, free mobility that the patient gets and we can control their uh, symptoms there sometimes they might choose to die at these hospices right so we are not giving them any aggressive intensive care treatment but we are keeping them as comfortable as possible knowing that death is inevitable for this patient so, so that is the other thing we do and phone call follow ups i think these are really amazing uh, we don't spend much on these also we got a smartphone for the department and we supplement the nurses already existing salary by 1000 or 2000 and we tell please take phone calls 24/7 and most of them have been uh, very enthusiastic and they uh, and they are helping us with that yeah. thank you thank you spandana uh, ramchandra i mean uh, hospice services are there i think there is one karuna shay is also uh, ramchandra's uh, friend sir uh, shrinagesh shima is actually running it that is he was in charge of it we will try to find out more um, thank you very much all of you it has been really an experience and uh, really opened up an eyes and uh, definitely looking forward to much more collaboration with you dr spandana anu jyoti as well as pooja thank you very much for participating thank you